So, uh, good evening and thank you for joining us. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Elka Patel, who's Associate Professor of Department of Art History, University of California, Irvine. Uh, Dr. Patel Alka is a leading scholar of South Asian and Islamic art. Her publication includes monographs and edited volumes focusing on Islamic architecture in South Asia, the Indian Ocean Literal, the idea of reuse in South Asian art, and more recently, Indo-Muslim cultures in transition from the 16th century to the 20th century. She's also working on a forthcoming volume on the interconnected histories of India and Iran. And I, her talk today emerges for her, from her current book project on the Ghurids of Afghanistan, including fieldwork she undertook in Iran and Afghanistan in 2011. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Thank you, Shagato, for the lovely uh, introduction. So for any inhabitant of or visitor to the city of Delhi, it is hard to imagine that the sheer mass of humanity, noise, and traffic did not always characterize this capital of the Republic of India. Indeed, almost a millennium in the past, before seven out of the eight well-known cities of Delhi were founded, either ex novo or on the remains of previous settlements, there was a time when it would have been hard to envision this locality as the capital of anything, much less a nation state that itself continually redefines even as it reaches for that elusive thing called modernity. What I present, present here today is part of my current book project on the Shansabamis, a small and short-lived dynasty originating in Ghur, central Afghanistan, for which they are commonly called the Ghurids, whose short-lived apogee is considered to be circa 1150 to 1215. Although the more or less precise date may be surprising for a pre-modern period, I believe the initial spark of a gradual metamorphosis transforming Delhi from an urbanized but still provincial settlement into the megalopolis of today can be placed in the 1190s of the Common Era, when the Ghur Shansavanis built upon their secure annexation of ex Ghaznavid holdings in the Punjab and extended even farther east into the plains of northern India. From a long durée perspective on urbanism, there is inherent interest in examining the intervening nine centuries of change in Delhi, a name I use for convenience here, though in surviving inscriptions, the site is referred to as Indraprasth, Yoginipura, and Dillika, each likely referring to a specific feature of the locality, which I'll talk about below, and all of which eventually came to be enveloped in one city. However, I propose that an examination of early Delhi can satisfy much more than mere urbanistic curiosity, for it was also at this juncture that a profound geopolitical change took place in the areas east of the Indus River. The region entered into a distinct and enduring connection with what was coalescing as the Persianate world in the aftermath of Seljuk supremacy. An examination of the physical changes in Delhi through its material culture in the 11th and 12th centuries serves as an entree into the transformation of northern India into an integral yet unique participant within this larger world. Indeed, the reciprocity of this participant role is also traceable, with albeit future, fewer excuse me, but still important material remains in Afghanistan. Thus, rather than an exclusively one-sided recipient status for North India, material culture serves to demonstrate the circulation of intellectual and physical commodities, as well as labor, in both directions of this newly facilitated connectivity. But why is this particular moment so worthy of attention? It is well known that prior to the 12th century, linguistic, religious, commercial, and artistic prapor between the Indic and Iranian cultural spheres had been underway since at least seven, several centuries before the Common Era. Indeed, during the first century CE, the imperial Kushanas attempted to harness parts of greater Iran and India under one political yoke, though the centrifugal tendencies of the two disparate regions made this a short-lived reality. And I couldn't help but show this for those of us who teach ancient India as well. It's nothing like this as a visual demonstration of the two different arenas of Kushana activity. 
Subsequently, the emergence of Islam in the late 6th, early 7th century CE in the Arabian Peninsula and its political and religious implantation in the Sasanian heartland of Iran within decades of the official beginning of its calendar brought additional religious, linguistic, political, and social layers to those enduring India-Iran connections. Thus, nearly a millennium after the Kushanas, the Ghur Shansabanis were again able to unify, albeit loosely and briefly, territories in the northern Indian plains and the Indus Punjab valleys with areas farther west. Ultimately, they succeeded in linking northern India and eventually the remainder of the subcontinent with the late Seljuk Persianate world in a meaningful set of relationships that endure into the present day. Historiographically, it should be noted that despite the Ghored's own purportedly peripheral status in the Persianate world, where they held trans-regional prominence for only about 50 years, and northern India's own secondary status for their cultural and political ambitions westward toward Iran, it was precisely here that they initiated the most enduring processes of historical change. But what made expansion into the subcontinent attractive in the first place? Chattopadhyay, along with others such as John Dayel, it's okay have provided an antidote to the theory of Indian feudalism, of course, which claimed that demonetization and decline in commerce and urbanism characterized the 7th through 12th centuries. Despite the paucity of evidence with which to paint a picture, these scholars have convincingly proposed broad contours of an alternative interpretation. Based primarily on epigraphy and numismatics, they have identified, for example, a surprising array of urbanized sites. These apparently included market towns, fork towns, temple towns, and larger urban settlements, all of which often had multiple functions that were referred to in inscriptions by their most distinguishable characteristic. Indeed, rulers frequently instigated or augmented urbanism and commerce by means of founding new settlements. The descriptions of Arab geographers such as Ibn Khurdadbe, Al Mas'udi, Al Istahi, and Ibn Hawqal collectively date to the early to mid 10th century and only confirm these findings. One of the principal cities of northern India mentioned by Arab geographers was not Delhi, but Kanoj. For about 250 years from the 10th century until the mid 12th, inscriptions and coins indicate that this city continually served as an administrative center and royal residence a contemporary, I mean a capital in contemporary parlance, successively to the Pratiharas, the Rashtrakutas, and by the 1050s, the latter's offshoot clan of the Gahadwalas. The probable importance of this capital, at least for a century more, and perhaps even up to the wooded campaigns of the 1190s, is highlighted by the circulation of Gahadwala minted Lakshmi type gold coins up to Kabul and Mazare Sharif in Afghanistan further refuting the notion that the polities of northern India were traversing a period of isolationism and political and economic attrition. Meanwhile, settlements such as Delhi and eventually Ajmer were relatively new foundations attributable to their respective area's ruling monarchs, likely serving as royal residences and being further cultivated as nodes of commerce and pilgrimage. Although we rely principally on epigraphic evidence for Ajmer, the Archaeological Survey of India dug seasonal trenches at Delhi in the mid-1950s through the late 60s, conducting sustained excavations near the Qutub area between 1992 and 97. The findings discussed below are fundamental to apprehending the geopolitical and cultural shift toward the Northwest and the consequent physical transformation of the landscape which the Ghorid campaigns initiated. Incidentally, it seems an ironic coincidence that the excavations were undertaken precisely during the aftermath of Ayodhya. While the reports have been published, they are surprisingly absent in subsequent scholarship on the medieval North Indian plains. Of course, it is possible that since the issue of Muslim occupations of primarily Hindu sites has been especially charged throughout the last 20 years, the actual objects unearthed in the excavations are difficult to access. 
Nevertheless, the lacuna once again demonstrates the intersection of political events and scholarly production. Evidently, a discernible settlement existed at the southern end of present-day Delhi since the first century CE. Texts referred to it initially as Indraprasth and later as Yoginipura, the latter possibly due to a much frequented but no longer extant Yogini temple in the vicinity. And the site was called Dilli or Dillika for the first time only in an inscription of 1170. It is noteworthy that most of the earlier phases of the site have been obscured or even erased due to the extensive reuse of baked bricks, a practice consistently evidenced from the Gupta period of the first millennium CE through another thousand years until the 16th century. Nevertheless, the multi-season excavations of the 1990s together with epi epigraphic evidence serve to create a plausible sequence for our purposes specifically of the 11th and 12th centuries. <coughs> In the second quarter of the 11th century, the Tomara Rajput ruler, Anangapal, first constructed a water tank or kunda in the vicinity of a temple, possibly the Yogini temple from which the settlement derived its ancient name, comparable to other such complexes in the region. Simultaneously or shortly thereafter, Anangapal ordered the construction of a fortified royal residence known as Lalkot, the first to be erected here, though the site had apparently been an urban settlement and perhaps also a place of pilgrimage for several centuries. By the mid 12th century, on the eve of the Ghor Shansabani's entry into northern India beginning in the 1170s, the Jahmanas of Shakambari near modern Jaipur and their subordinate clans farther west comprised one of the dominant powers in the region alongside the Chalukyas of Gujarat and the Gahardwalas farther east. In about 1120, the senior Jahmanas had founded a new royal and admis administrative center at Ajmer, possibly drawn to the location by the proximity of the holy site of Pushka, not unlike what attracted the Tomaras to Yoginipura. Ajmer emerged as a regional center of political power, eclipsing Indraprasth or Yoginipura, eventually Delhi, which the Chahamanas had annexed to their territories, territories by the late 1160s. Thus, upon their third and at last successful attempt at establishing a long-term foothold in North India, the Ghur Shansavanis encountered a landscape with scattered urban settlements of varying size, either independent or governed by vassals, owing at least short-term loyalty to a regional power, as in the case of Delhi. All indications are that with this landscape, Ajmer was the area's major political and cultural center, while Delhi played a subsidiary role as an ex-royal residence and fortification in a provincial territory. It is also notable that the Ghurid's North Indian campaigns were virtually simultaneous with their albeit brief annexation of Merv, the Seljuk capital. The two expanding frontiers thus shifted the rulers' energies toward maintaining their budding trans-regional prominence. Delhi began its own transformation into an urban center against this backdrop, and the structures erected by the Ghor Shansabani military force upon its occupation of the city provide a view into the material beginnings of the process. Delhi's first congregational mosque and slightly later Qutub Minar, both initially patronized by one of the uh, Ghurid deputies on behalf of his overlord, have already received much attention. While scholars have drawn parallels between aspects of the Delhi structure and its westward cousins, its extensive use of older building materials has inspired as much analysis as polemics and even political mobilization. But in the interest of time, here I examine the nearby palace apparently constructed by this deputy, which was unearthed during the ASI's excavations of the 1990s and which is also much less studied. The excavations at Lalkot unearthed the remains of a multi-room structure atop Tomara Chahamana remains, consisting of several spaces, including three interconnected rooms, all disposed around a central courtyard. The three-room sequence and the adjacent spaces are notable for the presence of cisterns. <coughs> 
Moreover, the building's ubiquitous white lime plaster coating led archaeologists to identify it as part of Cáceres the Fid, mentioned in textual sources as this deputy's residence. It would appear that the palace consisted partially of the reconfiguration of pre-existing Rajput structures, along with some newly built additions, almost completely obscuring the prior layers of occupation. It should be said at the outset that interpretations regarding Qasr-e Safid's architectural precedents can be only tentative given the absence of Tomara Jahmana palatial structures on the one hand, and on the other, for comparative purposes, the bad condition and partial excavation of the remains at the Ghor Shansabani's summer capitals of Firuzko in central Afghanistan. Nevertheless, Lashkari Bazar, the Ghaznavid winter residence to the west of Kandahar, could serve as a representative of palatial architecture in the eastern Persianate world during approximately the same period. The comparison is further justified since, according to the Delegation Archéologique Française in Afghanistan, their detailed publications uh, revealed that the South Palace here received extensive decorative changes during Ghorid occupation in the 1150s and more substantially in the 1170s. Of course, the scale of Lashkari Bazar's South Palace and Qasr-e Safid differed considerably given their respective circumstances of patronage and sites of construction. The South Palace being a royal foundation in an open plain, while Qasr-e Safid was essentially the architectural mark of a recently victorious military deputy on a pre-existing royal complex. Despite the absence of water features in the rooms at Lashkari Bazar, the overall disposition of rooms of varying sizes and functions around a central courtyard is clearly a shared feature. They also share a combination of disparate and interconnected spaces, the latter probably serving public, even ceremonial functions, while the smaller rooms were more private or otherwise utilitarian spaces. Shallow alcoves or niches also characterize the more formal rooms, puncturing their walls from floor to ceiling and appearing to be mini ivans within the individual rooms. The remaining fragments of lime plaster decoration on the Delhi Palace's walls are meager but valuable in further connecting the structure to Eastern Persianate precedents and pinpointing the period of construction. The ASI's archaeological reports indicated that plentiful carved white lime plaster fragments all around the excavated rooms hinted at this type of decoration originally gracing much of the wall surfaces. However, the Delhi fragments diverge in style and fabrication from their precursors at Lashkari Bazar being more akin to the carving on the Qutub Minar's first story decoration and the adjacent mosque's Qibla facade both in stone and dated by inscription to about 1199-1200, several years after the initial occupation of Delhi. The deep undercarving and the interpretation of typically lush Indian foliage in a more patterned, even repetitive rendition hints at the coming together of two different aesthetics. Other aspects of Qasr-e Safid's lime plaster show um, or contrast with the preponderance of stone carving in India, particularly for public edifices. The use of this more malleable and more ephemeral material points to the presence of imported workers or alternatively the expansion of local stoneworking techniques into a new medium. What seems to be an indication of a fundamental process of change in labor practices was not necessarily unusual given the new iconographies and styles that had already been incorporated into the Indian architectural canons in areas where Muslim mercantile communities had been established long before Islam's political entry into northern India with the Ghor Shansavanis. However, the unprecedentedly monumental construction for these new ruling elites again reinforces the geopolitical shift of energies toward the northwest and the Persianate world left by the Seljuks soon after their demise, just as powers such as the Ghurids were rising to prominence in the second half of the 12th century. In addition to the excavated qasr e safid the well-known facade of the Qutub Mosque's Qibla area and the Qutub Minar, uh, 
both additions to the structure in 1199 reinforced the direction of this westward geopolitical shift toward a, Sel a late Seljuk Iran. Certainly precedents for the Qutb Minar have been posited, and the tower represents a fascinating amalgamation of imported forms and meanings with localized modes and materials of construction. In the case of the Qibla facade also, it has, been date, it has been suggested that the earlier, possibly even Abbasid period mosques of Iran could have been points of reference. I would propose, however, that a more specific late Seljuk precursor was ultimately the source for the overall form and some elements of the decorative program of the facade, namely the elite caravansarai called Robat Sharaf near Nishapur and Sarafs in eastern Khorasan. This complex had been constructed at a as a principally royal way station for the Seljuk sultans as they traversed the routes between their later, ca later capital of Merv, now in Turkmenistan, and their holdings in Iran via Nishapur during the early through mid 12th century. Ghur Shansabani military forces captured Nishapur from the Khadizm Shahs in 1199. The period Sunil Kumar has characterized as, quote, the moment when Ghur appeared on the threshold of becoming a dominant political power in Iran, end quote. Although the Ghurid presence in what was ostensibly the heartland of the post-Seljuk Persianate world was short-lived, their emulation of the cultural trappings of this world were more enduring. Both the reconstruction of the Jami Masjid of Herat and the Qibla facade addition to the Delhi Jami, two cities among several where Ghur Shansabani power was concentrated, almost simultaneously adopted the lofty Ivan extended into an arcade with a prominent calligraphic program forming part of the overall decoration, not unlike the royal enclave of Robat Sharaf. Both palatial as well as public architecture in their new acquisition of Delhi then, embodies the Ghur Shansabani's cultural, political, and religious ambitions toward the post-Seljuk Persianate world, a set of priorities that transformed the landscape and widened the focus of North India as well. But was it a one-sided flow of ideas and transformations with the Ghur Shansabani's increasing political prominence in North India determining the future of this region's landscape with no reciprocal effect of the Indic traditions flowing westward. Most recently, Barry Flood has analyzed motifs of stylistically Indian origin on small to medium scale stone surfaces such as tombstones and sarcophagi. These are primarily attributable to the period of the Ghaznavid incursions into northern India of the 11th century and the move of the Ghaznavid sultans to their eastern capital of Lahore in the mid 12th century as the Shansabanis displaced them. While analyses of these objects have shown them to be significant as signs of a fashion or predilection for things Indian in the Ghaznavid lands, where motifs were copied possibly from portable commodities, the objects themselves do not appear to be the products of Indian artisans. By contrast, the small and out-of-the-way structure known as the Masjid de Sangi near the village of Larvand in Farah province, southwestern Afghanistan, indicates not only manufacture by Indian artisans, but also their transfer into the wooded heartlands to work on site. Unfortunately, this was a place that I was not allowed to visit during field work, so I've had to rely on historical photographs for the work. It would seem that with the Ghur Shansabani's establishment in northern India of an ascendant Islamic political culture itself originating in the eastern margins of the Persianate world, a mere fashion for things Indian was transformed into the direct importation of labor to produce Indian things. Although unique in its surroundings, which I discuss below, I hesitate to disregard the Master de Sangi as a simple aberration, as it is a tangible index of the important processes of communication of aesthetic ideas from the Shantabani's newly conquered territories into their land of origin. The structure's presence, moreover, demonstrates at least something of a reciprocal connectivity 
between the cultural worlds of Eastern Iran and India, a nexus that was newly facilitated by the Ghorshan Sabani's ambitions of conquest and long-term presence in uh, Northern India. To be sure, the masjid stands out from its landscape. A useful tool in de delineating these differences for analytical purposes is what has recently been defined as an architectural culture, a concept encompassing not only architectural style and how buildings looked, but instead conceiving of building practices as themselves indices of available natural resources and the resulting materials and methods of construction, labor economies, and stylistic traditions. While there was some distinction ensuing from the localized socio-political realities of these easternmost reaches of the Persianate world, it suffices to say for the present purposes that the Ghurid heartland from Herat through Bamiyan, if we include the collateral Shansabani clans in the latter region, largely fell within a post-Seljuk Persianate architectural culture. This was characterized by monumental building in baked brick with domed and lofty interior elevations, many defensive structures also having stone foundations, and intricate calligraphic and geometric decorative programs in cut brick, molded terracotta, and glazed tile. The Masjid de Sangi differs on all of these points with the surrounding architectural culture. The building is fashioned completely out of stone, a unique feature highlighted by its Persian name, Stone Mosque, and also requiring a low-slung post and lintel construction with splayed corner swinches, squinches, excuse me, and a corbelled interior dome. Thus, rather than being monumentally conceived, it is diminutive in scale, perhaps even serving as a private tomb, shrine, or mosque, given Warwick Ball's report of what were possibly the remains of a fortified structure nearby. Finally, both the exterior and interior decorative program is of carved stone rather than brick, terracotta, or glazed tile. To mix metaphors unabashedly, the masjid was cut from a totally different cloth than the architectural culture in which it found itself. Given that the masjid closely adhered to an architectural culture so completely different from that of the eastern margins of the Persianate world, it is generally accepted that laborers must have been brought to the site to complete the project. However, due to the structural and stylistic uniqueness of the masjid de Sangi and the absence of securely identifiable surviving materials in its vicinity to provide context, some basic questions continue unanswered. Despite the attention it has received for over half a century in historical, archeological, and art historical scholarship, the building's function and significance are largely unknown. One of the earliest mentions of the masjid is datable to the 1968 Persian language monograph, Ghurian, an, Ak an Afghani nationalist history of the dynasty by Atikullah Pajvak, the younger brother of the famed Afghani literateur and diplomat Abdurrahman Pajwak, who lived from 1919 to 1995. Thereafter, almost at regular intervals, archaeologists and art historians have taken up the mystery of the little building, beginning with the ar Italian archaeological missions Maurizio Tadei and Gian Roberto Scarcia in the 1970s, then Warwick Ball, the British doyen of Afghan archaeology in the 1990s, and most recently Finbar Flood in 2009. Across these various analyses, there is a general consensus that the structure is datable to the 12th or early 13th centuries, or the period of the Ghurid Empire's extension from Herat, and briefly even Nishapur in Iran, through Northeast India precisely as specific areas of the cultural spheres of India and Iran formed new and enduring political connections. Moreover, though the building is a mosque, it has been consistently related to contemporary, contemporaneous Northwestern Indian temple architecture, perhaps a reflexive gesture, given the distinctively recognizable elements present in both such as the Udumbara, or moonstone threshold, the apotropaic kirtimukkas on the multi-jam door frames, pilasters, and on interior lintels, 
which all point to correspondences and temple architecture of northwestern India, particularly modern Gujarat and Rajasthan. Indeed, such comparisons prompted Tadei and Skarcha to propose that with the erection of the Master de Sangi, its Shansabani elite patrons were attempting to absorb the pre-Islamic pagan cult of Zao, apparently still commanding followers in the more isolated areas of Gur, such as in this southwestern corner on the borders of the region of Zamin Dawar. Rather than the temple architecture of northwestern India, I believe we should look for comparanda to the small-scale mosques and tombs built within the mercantile communities along the coasts and in major urban centers of this region. As demonstrated by much work in the past, including my own, the patronage of buildings for Islamic ritual purposes, purposes had likely begun with the arrival of adherents of the new religion who continued to operate within the maritime networks of the Indian Ocean that had been in place for the previous several centuries. The initial period of experimentation and building for this new religious system in India slowly coalesced into a set of accepted architectural practices, distinguishable by region in their continuities with localized traditions. These practices ultimately formed the bases of architectural prescriptions contained in treatises, only a handful of which are known today, usually in incomplete form or through long quotations in subsequent texts. While Ram Nath has proposed the 15th century treatise Vriksarnav, as the earliest one addressing the construction of mosques, M. A. Dhaki has noted that the 11th or 12th century Jayaprita also distinguished or discussed this type of building, though details of the manuscript remain unpublished. The Master de Sangi then is better understood in light of coastal Gujarat's mosques dating to the mid 12th through 13th centuries and later actually aiding in the discernment of elements that differentiate Northwestern India's temple and mosque building practices. The Masjid's Gibla exterior is comparable to the same elevation of, sorry, you were supposed to see this slide before, just to give you an example of what the temples look like. Um, the Masjid's Qibla exterior is comparable to the same elevation of the mid-12th, early 13th century Choti Masjid of Badreshwar in Kutch district, Gujarat, while contemporaneous temple exteriors, excuse me, were heavily sculpted. The two mosque elevations are virtually bare. Both mosque exteriors have projecting mihrabs, circular at Badreshwar and angular at Larvand, or the one in Afghanistan. The principal decorative elements on both elevations are bands carved in relief at the top, inspired by the iconographic lexicon of North Indian temples, both mosques have the canonical sequence of overhanging cornice, recessed band with jewel, and ribbed eave traditionally concentrated at the base of a temple superstructure, here transferred to the equivalent point on buildings of Islamic worship. And unfortunately, the superstructures are no longer in situ on either building. Perhaps the most striking convergence is to be seen in the door frames of the two mosques. Um, again, while North Indian temples had heavily sculpted door frames whose multi-gem <coughs> format was obscured by the rich figural iconography, the two mosque entries share the aniconic and thus permissible uses of undulating vines and jewel or diamond motifs, uh, all crowned by the tajja or overhanging eave. With some degree of variation, the two door frames illustrate the plethora of motifs originating in the ambit of temple architecture, but now securely ensconced within an Islamic context, certainly in Northwestern India. So establishing the Masjid de Sangi's greater rapport with 12th to 13th century Gujarati mosques rather than temples is significant in two ways. First, it aids in confirming the date of the Afghani mosque to the latter half of the 12th or early 13th century, bolstering with physical evidence what had been a conclusion based on the circumstantial assumption that the Ghurid campaigns into North India must have garnered not only immense material wealth, 
but also new sources of labor. Perhaps more importantly, the Afghani mosque's direct relationship with the contemporaneous structures of northwestern India demonstrates the importation into Ghorid lands of something much more specific than a generic reference to Indian temple architecture. At La Rand, members of the Ghurid elite on the eastern fringes of the Persianate world patronized an already well-developed and codified tradition of Islamic building from a specific location within the Indic cultural sphere. Thus, while the Ghur Shansabani successes in North India brought unprecedentedly monumental building to the region in the service of a politically ascendant Islam, the smaller scale mercantile patronized structures of North India did not disappear completely. At times, these served the particular needs of the same political elites in their homeland. So, what more can we say about the geopolitical shift centered initially at Delhi, which conjoined northern India as an integral and unique participant within the Persianate world during the late 12th century? I believe some important points, among others, should be emphasized. First, the politically peripheral status of North India to the Ghur Shansabani's heartland in modern Afghanistan and their cultural ambitions looking westward toward greater Iran, within which they themselves have been considered secondary or peripheral, belie the very significant geopolitical and other processes of change initiated by, their means, by means of their entry into the subcontinent proper. Finally, and equally important, is the role of material culture, not only in gaining access to these processes for us, but in actually effecting them in their own time as innovations in the modes of fabrication and also in the actual labor infrastructure took place uh, during the transfer of ideas uh, and which plied these new conduits and underwent material execution. Thank you. I could begin with a quick question, and I was in LA when you were planning this trip to oh. Afghanistan, and we discussed this. Oh, that's right. So I wonder if, if you could, going away from the paper and thinking about the, the site where you were researching this, yes. and we are right now teaching a course on this question of archives, and we were discussing how archives are, how do you access archives, and how do you work with archives, and I wonder if you would want to speak a bit about your fieldwork experience and how that in a certain way access to this monument or lack of it affects this larger project or the arguments you're making? Well, sure. I mean, one, I think that there's an inherent challenge. Um, it, though I was fortunate enough to be able to do the field work that I intended, particularly in the Herat region, which was my, I mean, I would have loved to have gone to Chish, for example, which is the obviously the eponymous origin of the Chishtis uh, eventually in, in North India and all of South Asia. I would have loved to have gone into Farah province in the southwest. Uh, Kandahar would have been another site that I would have loved to have visited because that is actually the least known and, and it actually could be again within that region of Zamin Dabar where the Ghurids had a winter capital as it were. But those sites were not accessible to me and it seemed seems as if the um, actual on the ground reality changed from week to week, if not day to day. Um, for instance, Chisht was only accessible by means of helicopter at that point because of the, the constant dangers on the road between Herat and Obe, which is the, the small village near Chisht. Um, and it, actually instills in me a profound discomfort that I'm talking about a lot of structures that I haven't been able to document myself. Um, I guess I tried to compensate for it by spending a lot of time in Herat and also in the villages around and also doing work in Iran, but I think that um, uh, there is, uh, for me and for, for architecture, there is a lot to be said for viewing the object per se, right. and um, uh, one does find oneself on shaky ground, I think, if it hasn't been documented by your own hands. Um, fortunately, other people, uh, for instance, the black and white photographs I'm showing are from the 1960s, which is the last time, evidently, that uh, 
somebody with a camera went to La Grande, well, I'm sure that's not true, but those are the um, uh, photographs that have made it into public or accessible uh, uh, domain. And um, it was a lady named Josephine Powell, in fact, who was uh, intrepid and did all kinds of wonderful field work in these inner areas, if you will. I mean, we refer to the interior of, of the Indian heartlands as well, so it's, it's similar to that. And thankfully, it was a very thorough documentation, and the structure was quite small. So um, they are reliable photographs, but it is especially it is too bad that it's not accessible now. Hopefully it's still standing, or maybe somebody's moved it and put it together somewhere else. So. Hi, um, so just a couple of quick questions. One, yeah. I was wondering, um, how far back does the name Masjid is Sangi go for the rest of the uh, it's a relatively, certainly Josephine Powell referred to it as the Master de Sangi, and I get the feeling that um, it was, it could have been a rather oldish name, but I get, I mean, I, it's certainly current or was current as of a few decades ago. So the reason that it's meaningful, as I mentioned in the paper, is precisely because uh, the nomenclature picks up on the unique aspect of the structure. I mean, it really is very different from everything else that's around it. So um, I, I think this was not a, a detail that would have been lost, you know, on, on historical communities, so I wouldn't be surprised if the name were older, but certainly it's what it's referred to um, in recent memory. And this is a quick follow-up question. I guess I was wondering, I mean, I presume that some minor nobleman of the Murid order a ghulam of some sort perhaps decided to build this. Uh, would you care to speculate on the motives that lead someone to sort of appropriate an architectural style from you know, another place on the fringes of this newly acquired territorial domain and build it in? Well, this is one of the reasons that I kept kind of, come on, it, oh, doesn't work on there, never mind. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I kept, you know, throwing this map at you to uh, show this kind of uh, bringing together of these regions which do, I think, mainly to topographical differences and now, ironically, at a time when travel is supposedly much easier, actually less accessible than probably a thousand years ago. Um, and so just some kind of background is that uh, at first, um, it, it is true that the Afghani writer Atikullah Pajvak was probably among the first in the 60s who actually brought the structure to people's attention. Of course, before that, there were archaeological surveys, for instance, in the 50s, um, when the great minaret of Jam was discovered by, again, the French delegation. But um, Farah and Jam actually, they're quite far removed, so they were kind of different spheres of activity. Um, and then when um, Warwick Ball, the British archaeologist, was himself doing some um, travels, I guess, through Afghanistan, he noticed some elements that hadn't been talked about earlier. Actually, Pajvak, I think, had mentioned the fact that there were some minor structures, just a very low, virtually nothing left, but uh, very short elevations of walls that were still visible that seemed to be like a large enclosure. So it could have been um, a, uh, a some kind of a residential structure. And another interesting thing about Wood and, and the kind of the wooded heartland, it's, it's actually quite difficult to date exactly when, um, say, a fortification was um, actually constructed, because there's extensive reuse of so-called Buddhist period structures as well, particularly for fortifications. So it, the hypothesis is that this being such a small construction um, could have been, a, was most likely a private um, structure erected, as you said, by a member of the Shansabani elite. And um, it brings to mind, actually, some of these um, uh, basically tomb mosques, uh, commemorative mosques, shall we say, that um, became more and more common 
or at least that became sort of more prominent on the landscape in the late 12th century in a place like uh, what is modern day Pakistan. So um, not far from Multan, there's, there's a site that is both a tomb and a mosque, and it's, uh, and it's a fortified area. So um, there seemed to be a move towards consolidating all of these functions into these places. Now, obviously, the masjid is not you know, fortification in itself, but it could have been part of one um, and really served as a private, not sort of a well-frequented or a publicly frequented structure. Um, so my idea could, to add to what previous scholars have said, um, I would, I think of this emergence of the tomb mosque, if you will, or the commemorative mosque, uh, which maybe one could say really um, we see coming to a monumental scale with the tomb of Il Totmish in, in Delhi. But prior to that, a few decades prior to that, due to just the, the political, geopolitical realities of the region, these two mosques were coming to the fore. So this kind of a structure could have served a function along those lines, but even in the 60s, when Powell photographed there, it was dilapidated, it was not in use, was not maintained, and no actual excavation was done around it to, uh, or wasn't possible to to figure out what the context would have been. So doesn't necessarily, I don't have a one word answer, probably more information than you wanted, but there it is. <laughs> Thank you very much, it was very, very enjoyable. Um, you know, coming back to the Masjid Sangi, I know that Barry Flood does a lot of stuff with it too, um, and it just, you know, I was wondering, uh, I mean, he doesn't seem to talk about other structures of this kind, uh, and neither did you. And it seems like everyone's focus is on the Masjid de Sangi as this kind of one monument that speaks to these big, massive movements of artisans and mm. materials. And, and it's just funny because I, I mean, I would be extraordinarily uncomfortable. I mean, you yourself say it's a small uh, structure, mm -hmm. you, know, you don't know very much about it. There's uh, presumably not much. There are not many other structures like this that have drawn your attention None or anyone that are else's. Known, in fact. So I'm just curious, I mean, to what extent are you, I mean, okay, sure, so we have maybe a minor nobleman, maybe a, a Hindu who converts to Islam, who, you know, maybe was part, you know, one of these Hindu Khan, or, you know, one of these fellows, you know, who is part of the warrior elite of the Horids, he dies over there, that's the one little monument that we have. Um, I'm just curious, to what extent do you feel comfortable, uh, and you know, I think by extension, it's also a question for Barry Flood, um, you know, to what extent do you feel comfortable be making these very large arguments about transmission and circulation based on a very small uh, example of one, uh, essentially? Um, so I've got a couple of questions, but I'll just begin. The ghost of Masjid is. It must be. <laughs> Hindu Khan comes back. <laughs> um, actually, yeah, I don't know about Barry, but I think that um, for one thing, you're quite right, and um, it's acknowledged in all the literature as well that it's quite a unique structure. That's why I was, you know, showing all of these um, shots of how different it is from. Um, the remainder of the figurative landscape. So in fact, it is a unique structure. It's not like there are all of these popping up everywhere. But again, I hesitate to disregard it completely. And in fact, interestingly, I had the same debate with an archaeologist colleague of mine who's actually done the excavations at John Firuzko. Um, and so I was saying, but isn't this just a funny little building that, you know, uh, how much can we really make of it after all? It, uh, how much attention can we pay to it? So, and he actually said, well, the, the mere fact that it exists means that you have to come to terms with it. So I wouldn't say that my, um, my particular focus was to make huge claims about massive kind of influxes of artisans. I think mine was from a very material or a materiality point of view and also, um, from um, kind of a specifics point of view, which was that you know it's very tempting, as I said, because of the individual components to think about this as the result of this 
flourishing temple architecture in northern India, which is somewhat a contradiction in terms because the larger scholarship is very fond in some areas still of saying that, oh, with the beginning of uh, a political Islam in North India, there was a great waning of temple building. Um, but I think it's much more important to realize that, in fact, it was part of a tradition of mosque building in northern India, which had been in place and along, basically, the um, coastal areas as well as whatever the major nodes of commerce were. Um, it, it, was, it was actually a transplantation, if you will, of mosque building rather than of temple building. So while the artisans, and I've argued this in other places, I think it still stands, I think that there was a commonality, certainly an overlap, of the people who were building for various uh, communities, for various types of structures. It's not like here's a mosque wala and here's a mandir wala. You know, there was, there was probably um, more of an integration or a commonality of the actual labor. However, it's important to realize that there was already a very strong and even codified and, and recognizable mosque building tradition for those quite powerful, actually, mercantile communities in northern India, and that was what was being referred to. So I, I guess I leave aside for the moment the question of mass migrations of artisans, but I did want to make that what I think is an important distinction, that the, the um, more uh, humble, if you will, or at least the smaller scale, smaller proportion structures that were being patronized by uh, the communities of northern India actually continued to be so. It's not as if they, on the India side, were completely erased by these monumental buildings that certainly the Ghurids were the first mm -hmm. to institute in that region. Um, that, in fact, these uh, uh, more intimately proportioned buildings, uh, even though we might consider them as rather humble and not very significant, um, found some kind of an expression or a manifestation in a very unlikely place. I don't know if this means that there is a mass import of artisans, but the, it, that was a corrective that I wanted to definitely um, institute. <coughs> Maybe a desperately hopeful question, but um, following up on what is and isn't available in terms of images, uh, I assume that we don't have or have not yet found any painted images of this architecture or similar. Um, you mean renditions of buildings like this? So that if this is the only one that we have, and it's the singular case, et cetera, that maybe in 1500, we have a painting that references it, or? Oh, uh, not that I know of. Um, and you know, these kinds of like, presences and absences can go both ways, right? I mean, some say that, oh, well, precisely because things were so common and so integrated into, um, of uh, uh, the zeitgeist or, or just the perception of a time, they weren't necessarily chosen as something that texts or other uh, expressive media would seize upon. Um, on the other hand, it absence may be the indication definitely of uh, their lack of significance, if you will. Um, but I do not know of any visual renditions of certainly specifically this building, though interestingly enough, I mean, this minor Persianate dynasty, um, hopefully it came through in the presentation that I think they need to be paid much more attention than being simply integrated into a larger kind of um, presentation, a more general idea of Islam in South Asia. I think there were some very specific um, moments in historical process that have to be highlighted. Um, they um, have, I think until recently, really kind of fallen through the cracks, if you will. They, they are considered really a minor 
blip on the radar, you know, the, the well-known CE Bosworth says that they were simply an interlude. Um, so they've really been considered minor on both the Persianate world side and for different reasons on the India, South Asia side. So um, in some ways, I suppose, you know, this structure might be something of a metaphor for, for them uh, in that um, some consider them very minor while others consider them just part and parcel of a very big kind of behemoth that doesn't have enough differentiation as far as I'm concerned. Um, but, you know, there are these historical moments and monuments that really deserve, I think, some detained attention. If I might take a little bit, oh, Joanna, please. Go. Just uh, a trivial, <laughs> minor question. An important part of this picture, which I learned about from your own writing, is the texts on how to build book mosques. Do th those uh, indicate for whom they were, to whom they were directed? That's, um, that's a good question. Um, the Riksadna, the 15th century text that Ramnath has talked about, is really the only one where um, I believe the manuscript or various manuscripts or copies of this text are available. Um, so not in his analysis, I haven't been able to consult any of the manuscripts, but Knott's, in his analysis, indicates not necessarily, actually the only indication for whom a structure like this would have been built is basically for those who believe in the, um, I think the word is nirguna, I want to say, a nirguna deity. Hence the, um, <coughs> And interestingly enough, though they're not, though they're not treatises, you know, another really interesting uh, and important reference to the communities for whom these structures were directed are inscriptions such as the famous mid-13th century inscription where um, the deity uh, itself is referred to as Lakshya Lakshya. So having both Lakshanas and being without Lakshanas. So um, that is really the closest, I guess, one comes to th having any kind of um, evocation by the sources themselves as to who the audience was. Um, the texts are geared, as we know, and they're not even sort of these tight uh, uh, prescriptions, you know, that the doctor gave you that you have to follow uh, as, um, Madhuri Desai recently talked about in the essay on um, uh, Ram Raz, that you know, going about trying to find these buildings precisely as you see them described in the text is a futile exercise. So um, th th yeah, the, the audiences are not referred to, it seems to me, at least from the work that's come out, except in these very oblique terms that say that, well, this is a nirguna deity, or one that is both formful and formless. Um. So if I might take the liberty of asking you one more question, since I'm standing here. Uh, the, the question of scale, and, and, and this question of the large mosque versus the small mosque, and how, and, and what I see, in, what I hear in the paper is that, that scale being a governing principle, right, in the sense of how we read architecture. Mm -hmm. And what I initially thought that this question of scale was a regional question. It was the mosque on the coast versus something in Delhi. But it's, is it, but after your conversation it emerges that this is also a community question. It's the mercantile community versus the ruling elite. So I wonder how scalarity fits in both in terms of geopolitics and in terms of let's say community politics. Well. I think that scale becomes a question at, at this point, precisely, because prior to really a, a, the establishment of an elite with Islamic affiliations in northern India, 
Of course, there had been communities of adherents to Islam for several centuries before that within India, within larger South Asia. Um, and, and for our purposes, perhaps the subcontinent proper. But it would appear that with the very few remains that we have, um, the, the buildings com uh, constructed for those groups were much smaller in scale. They probably um, were, well, they certainly didn't have this kind of politically proclamatory quality to them. So at least historically or traditionally, that's how the scale has been explained, that they were very much for groups of local worshipers and also travelers, people who came from places like the Persian Gulf, Aden, East Africa. Um, and uh, so there were definitely places of worship for very kind of focused communities, if you will. But um, it seems that all of a sudden, and in part, I think this also explains the extensive reuse of building materials, is that all of a sudden there was um, a, polit a political expedient that would be met by establishing a much, much larger in-scale structure, such as the Qutub complex, what eventually became the complex. That really was an unprecedented scale for, for that part of the world in terms of mosque building. So, so scale becomes a question for specific reasons, I guess, at this temporal juncture and because of these events, because of these historical processes. Um, I guess one could speak further about who the anticipated, again, audience would be for such a grandiose structure. And I don't think that that was really a primary question for this burgeoning of scale. I think it was much more of a state building practice. Right. I, uh, I, we, we, I understand the political sort of political commitments to scale, but I, yeah. I'm thinking of the architectural commit, commitment, uh -huh. commitments to scale as a, as a sort of architectural vision, which is not necessarily about you need a bigger mosque as the as the Muslim population. So you mean the yeah. workers who were actually employed? Or even the idea of what architecture is, what a mosque is. Uh -huh. Is that then a regional thing or is it? Because I see two sorts of uh, ideas of scale here. One is uh -huh. in, in this particular mosque. One is in terms of the coastline and the mosque from the coastline, yeah. Gujarat or, or farther south, farther okay. south, and then you have this sort of the Central Indian mosques, like Delhi. I mean, not uh -huh. Indian mosques. So, and and I wonder in terms of thinking about scale as a governing principle of architectural design, is there a way in which we sort of which transcends a certain political discourse, and it is about form, if that. Um, I don't know if we could actually link specifically to. scale right. because I'm thinking of also the other known remains that probably belong to or were patronized by these smaller communities right. that were pockets you know throughout um, various regions of the subcontinent and um, the the large one of the unifying characteristics, one of the very few in fact, because there really are these regional affiliations to um, how a particular mosque in a particular region develops. So, um, so you're looking within a political yeah, so if you So if you look at the, the work that's been done again by, by the French in Sindh, or of course years ago uh, Michael Willis published the Mihrab from Gwalior, um, all of them actually are quite diminutive in scale. Um, so it, do, it doesn't seem that size was a governing principle in architectural design. It was more the reinvention and the resignification of existing architectural traditions. Um, it, it again becomes a question of scale because in hindsight, of course, we cannot help but see the sudden difference between those smaller mercantile communities and the much larger constructions. Um, I mean, in a way, it becomes, I suppose, a regional dynamic, again, because of this temporal pivot and the, the geopolitical changes that were taking place at this time. Then, of course, one could contrast the very small-scale, intimate 
structures that were still under worship that were certainly still being used by those coastal or smaller mercantile communities with the much bigger things right. so the question, that were being For built. me, the question of aesthetics is, is sort of a thing that I sort of would like to think about instead of just locating it within a sort of instrumentalist political governance model uh -huh. and to think about theology, think about the ways in which we think architecture, which is not necessarily about as a very instrumentalist governance model. So I wonder in that sense, what sort of theological aesthetics that in terms of Islam would you think about scale, size, grandness, big, small? Would mm -hmm. there be a play in terms of Islamic aesthetics? Well, that, in a way, would be, I guess, um, a greater dialogue or a rapport, again, with what was going on in um, the areas that are adjacent to India and even eastern Afghanistan, where eastern Iran, for instance, by this um, point in time in Central Asia, had um, structures that actually had a lot in common, and scale-wise, they were really quite big, but there was a variety. They weren't all gigantic. In fact, there were smaller scale structures that were still constructed um, in um, the Persianate land proper, in the Persianate regions proper as well. So uh, scale and aesthetics, I mean, I will grapple with your question further. I look forward to it. <laughs> but any more questions? Or Sorry, just one last question. I mean, on this conversation, I just thought it was interesting to think about the fact that maybe uh, the Delhi complex is a public complex, right? So it's clearly designed for a public of a certain kind. Whereas the Masjid is Sangeet, now, once you said that it, it, you know, it might have be associated with a tomb, suddenly a lot of things seem to click for me in the sense that one can think of this as a private, personal space that is as much tomb. Mm -hmm. as it is mosque and perhaps more tomb and less mosque in a sense, mm -hmm. which raises the question of whether um, this is a private act of a certain person who made it in India and came back, um, right? And, it, and it's a sort of demonstration of that, right? Which puts it in a separate category altogether um, from something that you would see in Delhi, right? And so, so scale then would be about sort of intimate personal mm -hmm. celebration right. of a lifetime of achievement. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, versus um, or mem memorialization yeah. or memorialization yeah. precisely by a family member mm -hmm. um, or a new retinue as opposed to a sort of space that is created to transform a space around it mm -hmm. right which is certainly the case in Delhi. well and again um, the choice of either made by the patrons and or the actual fabricators of the structure were I think um, certainly derived from the fact that, these structures, the um, smaller, uh, uh, more community-centered uh, buildings had already been built in India, and there was a collective right. architectural experience. So again, I, I think I haven't even fully plumbed the ramifications or the implications of the fact that there was a coalesced um, mosque architecture that was being referred to rather than just some generic oh, here's an element here and there from temple architecture. I think there was a, a recognizable mosque architecture that was being was the referent for right. the masjid, right. rather than just, oh yes, well the Jains were building, and then these people were building, and look, they have a moonstone, right. so. Yeah. Yeah. That last question. Well, just to add to this conversation about scale, I mean, if we think of, I mean, one of the most important things for me in your talk is that, you know, we're not taking it just from temples, but look what's happening with mosques in that region of time. I think that's a really important intervention. But if we look, not but, and, if we look at um, even temple architecture from some of the regions that you were showing in Rajasthan between a thousand and, you know, 12th century, or you know, 950 and 12th century, the scale is very similar to this, even for regal architecture that was public. Or say, you know, having something without all the surface design. I kept on thinking the whole time of the La Kalisha Temple at Iglinji, which has green <coughs> stone walls um, and is a yeah. it's a very small. I mean is very similar in many ways to this. And in that same belt, the Sasbahun complex. So in that. terms of something formal and something having to do with scale, but not necessarily even um, 
eschewing a kind of geopolitical read of architecture, but even a, a sectarian one. Like maybe this is something that's happening regionally at this time. And there's um, Hindu temples on that scale in that region in the same by the same dynasty, everything that are super highly surface decorated and other ones that, that are, are not. like this. Mm -hmm. at the, you know, together. So yeah. Th that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. More over wine. Oh, <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.